Uh, thank you, Pastor Jackson. Uh, didn't realize you'd become the president of the North England Conference. I have quite a history with that conference. In fact, hearing Paul sing that song reminds me that as a young man, uh, when I did my first North England camp meeting, which was your first camp meeting ever, on that closing Sabbath, I preached and a young man sang the song, I'm running back to you. That young man just sang it, <laughs> Paul Lee. So a lot of warm memories are stirred. Thank you, Sister Reed and your team for allowing me to come. You welcome you to my study. You see the books behind me. This is my sermon factory where hundreds of sermons have uh, been written. To be invited to speak on the subject of prayer. Wow. I was thinking, Pastor Jackson and others, as I prepared for this, that is there more, is there a more important subject in the church than prayer? I cannot think of what it is. Be it Sabbath, law, diet, What's more important than prayer? It's the only link, the only link we have, the only link we have with God that is unbreakable. You can't stop me from praying. I can stop me from praying, but you can't stop me from praying. We can pray anywhere, anytime any place. We can pray without moving our lips. We can pray in the car. We can pray outside, cutting the grass behind the lawnmower. We can pray morning, noon, and night. Hallelujah. Thank God for prayer. <laughs> That's so why I've entitled my remarks for today, the power of prayer, the power of prayer. Could we just bow? Uh, Father God, thank you now for this moment to share. In the name of Jesus, amen. Uh, I'm gonna read just a, a brief uh, text over here in Philippians, if you don't mind, Philippians, the first chapter. And uh, verse, verse 9, yes, Philippians 1, verse 9, I'm reading from the New King James Version. And this I pray, writes Paul, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. And this I pray. That's Paul writing. In fact, you find him again in 2 Thessalonians 1.11 saying, pray for me. Uh, 1 Timothy 2 and verse 8, Paul again, pray for me. Hebrews 13 and verse 18, the words there, pray for us. Paul was a man of prayer. The church rides on prayer. I want to paint three imaginary scenes. First, picture Adam, our first father, our first human, and the first two children named in scripture. Adam with his two sons, Cain and Abel. Picture them now. There's an early morning mist surrounding them. And as dense as the mist is, it cannot hide the glow of something just ahead. As this man and his young sons draw closer, you can see uh, and sense awe and expectation in all three. The glow now is distinctly coming from a sword held by an angel. Hallelujah. The powerful looking extraterrestrial 
is guarding the way to what appears to be a break in a tall wall of trees. You're imagining now with me, Adam and his sons quietly but purposefully go about their work. They kill a lamb and sacrifice it on a simple altar. It is obvious from the blackened, blood-stained rock that this altar has been used many times. And then Adam and Cain and Abel kneel. That's based on a scene found in the book Patriarchs and Prophets, page 52. Now, the second imaginary scene. Noah and seven other weary human beings are gathering stones and stacking them in an orderly fashion. Behind them, far away, is a huge structure. At first, we can't tell what it is, but as our as the, as the eyes of our imagination grow closer, uh, we can see that it's, it's a house. No, it's, it, it's a boat, a huge boat, three stories high. Uh, the measurements of this boat are based on the size of people in that day. The average height, some say, may have been 14 feet tall. The boat is nestled in the rocks. Stay with me now. It does not appear damaged. And standing around it are animals of every size and description. Birds fly nervously in and out of the only window in this huge boat. But back to those seven people having built the altar, back to those eight people having built the altar, they are kneeling. That's based on a scene in Genesis 8 and verse 20. One more scene. Use your imagination for a third time now. This time I see a huge caravan. It seems to stretch almost to the horizon. But now it is coming to a stop. There appear to be cattle and camels and goats and sheep by the multi thousands. Is this a family or a nation? There is much bustle as, as tents are pitched in the style and manner of the Middle East of that time. And then a man of obvious dignity and bearing in years, with a beautiful though elderly woman beside him walks toward an altar that, the, that has been readied by the servants in the camp. And then everyone in the camp, listen to me, everyone in the camp, as a sacrifice is made, kneels. There must be over a thousand people in this family kneeling with, with, with bowed heads, at, at least some, while others with arms outstretched toward heaven and eyes up, uh, uplifted. What are they doing? That is based on Genesis 12, and verse 7. Well, there's no mystery. They are praying. Yes, they are praying. It's the Hebrew word to Paulo. It means to, to cut or wound. It means to fall. It's based on the word palal. It means to make an assessment. It means to make a judgment. Prayer, my subject, the power of prayer. In every part of the Bible, from Moses on Mount Sinai to Jeremiah in a mud pit, we find human beings doing this strange thing awesome and deliberate thing. It is not always accompanied by sacrifice, but it's a deliberate thing. And wherever it is taking place, it is accompanied by earnestness and reverence or accompanied by tears and, and pleading. The record testifies that when people pray, water stands on its tiptoes, that power. <laughs> you can pray. What is prayer? Adam will tell you that if you can't talk to God face to face, it's the next best thing. Eliezer, the servant of Abraham, will tell you that if you can't find the right wife or the right man, just pray. <laughs> the three Hebrew boys will tell you that prayer flying on the wings of faith is faster than the speed of light. It can turn a fiery furnace into an air-conditioned sanctuary. Elisha will tell you that prayer can, can, can do little things like make an axe head float. 
But Peter says it also can turn itself into a key and let a man out of prison. Hallelujah. Paul says this thing is so important. Whatever you church folk forget to do, please, he says, please remember to pray for us. <laughs> We know what the famous author Ellen White wrote. She says, prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. Steps to Christ, page 96. Let's take a closer look at that statement. Prayer is the opening. I want to look at that word opening. Webster gives seven definitions for the word opening. It's the fifth definition that interests me. It says that an opening is an opportunity. Now just hold that for a minute. And then the sixth definition that Webster lists for opening is that an opening, listen now, an opening is an unfulfilled spot <laughs> or position for which a person is wanted. Wow. Let's first deal with this idea of opening being an opportunity or, or prayer being an opportunity. Prayer in one phase of its operation is a disinfectant and a preventative. So says Ian e. Bounds, the famous writer on prayer. That's in his little book, The Purpose of Prayer. Prayer is a voice that goes into God's ear. God shapes the world through prayer. The heart that may have sent the prayer, listen, the heart that may have prayed the prayer may stop beating, but the prayer is still alive because it's in the mind of God. And so prayer has an eternal factor. Your mama prayed for you. She's dead, but her prayers are in the mind of God. He's alive, eternal. So her prayer, though she's dead, is still alive. Listen to the preacher. Listen to me. Listen to me. Prayer is an opportunity to put God in full force in the world. For, a th for, for, for there are things that will never happen unless the prayer of faith is uttered. Again, Ian e. Bounds writes, the prayers of God's people are the capital stock in heaven, I like that, by which Christ carries on his great work on earth. Thus, the mightiest successes that come to God's cause are the direct result of prayer, not just talent, not just planning, not just zeal, but because someone, after all, this other stuff that we certainly need, said a prayer and moved the heart of God and made themselves and their requests irresistible. Do you know that through prayer, you can make yourself irresistible. Do you know that? I know it. <laughs> Prayer, therefore, is an opportunity to enter a world of privilege and bring the strength and wealth of heaven down to earth. Praying people, praying leaders, oh yes, praying pastors, keep God in the church in full force. Think about that. Prayer keeps God in the church in full for force. <laughs> Elder Jackson, prayer keeps God in full force in the North England Conference. Prayer keeps God's hand on the helm. It brings power and trust when we pray. Why do we pray? Why do we pray? Well, first of all, as you can see by now, everything depends on prayer. Prayer is not a religious exercise. Prayer is not 
mere religious duty. Prayer is necessary to turn needs and hopes and dreams that are in keeping with God's will into reality. Why do we pray? Remember, I was interested in Webster's last two definitions on the word opening. Ellen White said that prayer is the opening of the heart. Webster says that not only is opening an opportunity, it is also a vacancy which needs to be filled. Let me deal with that now. Let me deal with that now. Why do we pray? We know the story how sin separated between God and man. You know how Adam lost his right to look God in the eye. You must try to imagine how Adam felt knowing that there was a vacancy, a vacancy in himself. knowing that on his own, he could not fill. There was a position open that only prayer can fill. God will not barge into your life. He does not deceive us into letting him in. He does not intimidate. He does not negotiate. He knocks and waits and knocks again. He comes as we ask. The vacancy is filled if you ask him. The vacancy in your life is filled if you ask him. The vacancy in your soul is filled if you ask him. And we ask by prayer. Why do we pray? Because only, because only God can move mountains and only prayer <laughs> can move God. And therefore, the preacher is not only to get men and women to join the church. The believer is not just to get their friends in the church and to do better, but, but, but we must get people to be prayer filled, to trust God, to get God in their life, to be prayer channels whereby God's power invades the earth and permeates and disinfects and prevents and heals and fills the vacancy left by fear, doubt, ignorance, and COVID-19. Lord have mercy. Of all the duties enjoined by Christianity, none is more essential, yet none is more neglected than prayer. Prayer is an opening. Prayer fills the vacancy. Why should a strong prayer life be the heart and soul of your, of your life, <clears throat> your personal life? But life on planet Earth, hear me, saints, takes its toll on us, on our, on our spouses, on our children, on our friends. And, 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 and that toll can create vacancy. And these vacancies can take uh, serious forms. One of the most common is a vacancy of intensity and reverence. Simply put, the sacred can lose its all and you, 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 you can begin to serve strange fire. The other gap that can occur that will beg to be filled is the vacancy of vision. I must be able to see beyond my life. I must be able to see beyond my own quest, beyond myself and my spouse's needs, my children's needs. I must be able to keep, I must be able to keep a vision of the whole of which I am the part. In other words, prayer keeps you from being selfish. Well, how should I pray? Prayer has to do with the entire person. As the whole nature of man enters the praying, all that the person is or has can benefit from the praying. You see, prayer in its truest sense is an expression of the life and the needs acknowledged in the life. I don't have time to develop that fully, but let me illustrate. The demoniac did not have the life 
but he did have the realized need. What little control he yet had of himself drove him to the feet of Jesus when he saw Jesus. When he sought to cry out his need, Satan spoke. Jesus read the heart and, and caught the request that this wretched soul would have prayed had he had the capacity and the freedom. And Jesus gave him freedom. On the other extreme, Jesus, his whole life being was prayer. Listen, by, by myself, I can do nothing, John 5.30. I've come to do the will of him who sent me, John 6.38. I can do nothing of my own, John 8.28. This is a description of life that was a life of prayer. In other words, Jesus and the demoniac had something in common. They could not act without prayer. The demoniac could not speak, and Jesus said, I can't do a thing unless I do the will of my Father. Now, if Jesus, the only perfect man on the planet, had to pray to please God, how do you think you're going to get by <laughs> without prayer? But the essentials of prayer are devotion, dependence, which grow out of humility and lead to a spirit of praise and thanksgiving. And of all these are harnessed and aimed by the one thing that makes man irresistible to God, and that is sincere faith and trust. And so how do we pray? We pray out of our life. We pray out of our need, or both. You see, this is why prayer is so often preceded by kneeling. In fact, sometimes you will read in the Bible, the ancient ones laid flat on the ground before God. Uh, kneeling was too tall. This was not done for show or for form or for some extra credit with God. Listen to me now, listen to me. But the position of kneeling or laying flat on the ground, parallels the state of your soul. <laughs> One helplessly kneels in the face of the reality of who I am talking to and the condition of the one doing the talking. In other words, I kneel before God because I see myself and I see him and I know there is no comparison. I have no standing before God. How dare I do any less but kneel and bow <clears throat> and, yes, if necessary, grovel before God. I kneel because my ego has already been bent before him. My stubbornness has already dropped to its willful knees before him. I come boldly in the light of his invitation to come, but humble and broken in the light of his state and my state. Therefore, the first act of prayer is not a physical one, but a mental one. I decide to pray. I do not stumble into prayer. My need and my love and my all precede me into the closet. And I hopefully arrive with evil and frivolous thoughts eliminated. I'm dwelling on what is needed and encouraged by what he has done in the past. That is why pride cannot pray. I'm overwhelmed, I'm in love, I'm privileged, I'm special to the one who does not need anything from me. God needs nothing from me. When I leave the closet, I do not leave the praying, and all I do, I'm praying, leaning, trusting, thanking, my soul is open, my life is a channel, I am a prayer. I pray regularly like Daniel. Daniel, I sometimes pray urgently like Jacob, I sometimes pray only the essential, like the drowning Peter, Lord, save me. I pray selflessly, like Moses. I pray broken, like David. I pray joyful, like Paul. I want to pray obediently, like Jesus. What are the benefits of prayer? There are many attributes to desire as you contemplate a future organization, 
patience, knowledge, eloquence, dependability, confidentiality, on and on we could list the things we need. One of the most essential is an attribute that was held up before me when I left the seminary about umpteen years ago. <laughs> I had just finished my interview with Elder C.E. Dudley, my first conference president, the one who hired me and employed me, gave me my first chance in the work. He's now resting, waiting on the sound of the first trumpet. The conference had decided that my first assignment would be in North West Mississippi. The ink on my master's diploma was barely dry from Andrews University. I felt so inadequate. I turned to leave Elder Dudley's office and then I paused. He queried, the young man, is there something else? I said, Elder, what is the essential need of a minister aside from the converted life? He did not, he did not appear to even hesitate before he responded. Good judgment, he said. Just plain old good judgment. Hmm. I read a story about some miners trapped underground after an explosion. One of the more experienced rescuers said to the anxious team of men gathered to dig them out, dig them out. We don't need a lot of fancy digging equipment now. Just a long pipe and a powerful hammer, he said. You see, there is gas down there. The pipe will do two things. It will relieve the pressure and also give them fresh air. Good judgment. It took me a few years to really understand what Elder Dudley was talking about when it comes to the need for good judgment, but I came to know its value and where you get it. See, the whole human race is trapped in a cave. There was an explosion at Eden and we became surrounded with the poisonous gas of sin. An experienced rescuer, hallelujah, said we have to relieve the pressure and at the same time supply some fresh air. <laughs> you see, my believers, the fresh air clears the head of the trap so that they do not make panic decisions and imperil their lives further. Prayer is the pipe. The air is the spirit of God, the greatest gift that can be received as a result of prayer, and the fruit is a mind that God can trust because it is a mind dependent on the wisdom of God, on the wisdom of God. Good judgment comes from prayer. Well, let's close this now. The world needs effective prayers more than it needs effective preachers. It is a simple truth about Jesus that never a man lived as he lived because never a human prayed as he prayed. Every time I read in Luke 6 and verse 12 that he prayed all night, I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed. Oh, I've done it a couple of times. I got to feel that with Jesus, it was a lot more regular. And look at the life that he lived. We should all be embarrassed. Thus, because of the way Jesus prayed, never a human being had the impact on this planet that Jesus had, because never a human being brought God's intervention into the affairs of life through prayer the way Jesus did. Learn to pray. That's what this weekend is about. Read about prayer. See prayer as the foundation of your life, your marriage, your ministry. In November of 2017, my wife was diagnosed with dementia. And last year in the summer, she was additionally diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Oh yes, no boast. I have learned to pray as I've never prayed before just for strength to get through a day, just for courage to keep thinking positive, 
just for trust that God will supply. Nobody has to urge me to pray. Nobody has to plead with me to pray. I rise on prayer and I go to bed on prayer and I walk through the day in prayer. And believe me, the more responsibility you are trusted with, the more you got to pray, Pastor Jackson. The more prayer, because the more glory gained, Satan gains, gains by defeating you. There's a text in Revelation 5 and verse 8. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders who stood before the land, each having a harp and a golden bowl filled with censers, which are the prayers of the saints. There it is, Revelation 5 verse 8, proof, proof that my prayers get all the way to the throne of God. John saw your prayers, my prayers, our prayers. Prayer is real. Prayer cuts through time. Prayer is faster than the speed of light. Prayer cuts through Orion. Prayer arise. You pray now, God hears now. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let me take you back to our first scene. Adam and his sons turned to leave the gateway to the Garden of Eden. My imagination sees a leaf, dry and desolate, dislodge and drift aimlessly to the ground. It does not escape the notice of this first man who has just prayed, a heart a perfectly constructed heart that will beat for almost a thousand years, knows what it feels like to be separated from God. And now my mind's eye sees a tear, a very wet tear, run aimlessly down this face shaped by the very hand of God. There's a heave of the huge chest and the broad shoulders simply slump. And now tears are falling down the face of Adam uncontrollably. He has lost face-to-face -face communion with God. But at least he can pray. God bless you, my friend, whoever you are. Don't let the devil take your best weapon. Never let anything, never let anything keep you from praying. Let us bow. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins. Lead us not into temptation. Oh Lord, have mercy on us. For thine is the glory, the kingdom, and the power forevermore. Lord, hear our cry. Hear our prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen.